Good morning. Um, we, there's a lot we don't know about this uh, new variant. And we spoke to the uh, esteemed epidemiologist, uh, Professor Sinetra Gupta from Oxford University about this uh, earlier. And she was saying, well, look, you know, what is the virus doing that we don't uh, expect a virus to be doing? And, and it is doing what we expect to do. And yet each time there's a new variant, there's massive new concern. It does appear, although she said we don't know yet whether it looks like it may be more transmissible. But if people are getting largely... Um, lower symptoms, common cold symptoms, and if people are en masse vaccinated, anyone who wants to be is vaccinated in this country, should we even be considering any restrictions at all? No, we've already gone far too far. I mean, I asked the Secretary of State yesterday how many of the 360-odd um, people who had uh, tested positive were actually ill. And he hummed and hard a bit, but I think the answer he was stabbing at and trying to avoid was none. Yep. And uh, I, I, I'm absolutely at a loss as to the extraordinary state of affairs as these crazed scientists, the Dr. Strangeloves of Spy M, Sage, Independent Sage, uh, believe that their socialist wet dream is about to come true and they'll be able to control our lives again and impose all sorts of sanctions upon us. There, there do seem to be people who are sort of rubbing their hands with glee at all of this. And I have to say, I think an awful lot of our mainstream media are among those who seem to be uh, very keen uh, for us to have restrictions. And no doubt that's down to the fact that uh, an awful lot of TV, uh, for instance, uh, TV uh, advertising sales go up when people are just stuck in their homes, it would appear. They're getting a lot more a lot more money, a lot of people watching. Well, but... I, I'm, afraid, I'm afraid I have to have a stiff brandy if I ever listen to BBC News commentators or Sky commentators hyping this up and you're actually relishing it. I will be very disappointed if any of the new variant sufferers are um, hospitalised, but I almost get the impression that some of these crazed people will be delighted because of the implications for us all. Yeah, and that's the thing. And even though we already now know, I mean, we knew early in the first lockdown in spring last year, really early on, the likes of sort of health charities, um, cancer charities, and those domestic abuse charities, raising concerns about uh, families in crisis, people not getting treated, people dying, the you know, cancer and, and, and not getting referred, children de devastated by not being at school. We knew everything that's been coming out in recent weeks and months, we knew by, you know, by May, at the latest last year, May at the latest. And yet we carried on with that lockdown. And then we went into another mini one in November last year in England. And then we went into the full scale one in January that lasted for six long months, another three weeks to flatten the curve. When we have this huge amount of evidence of the effect of lockdown and the devastating effects it has on so many aspects of our lives, I haven't even mentioned the economy there, by the way, or, or businesses or jobs. Um, it is extraordinary that people are still talking about it as a solution to the problem when we know what the solution is. The solution is vaccinations. And we are a mass vaccinated country. If you want to be vaccinated in this country, you've had a free vaccination. You've had two. You can have your booster. And, and that's all we need to do, surely. Yeah, well, quite. I mean, I, my attitude to vaccinations is, is, you know, if it's free, I'll have one too. Um, I, I do have some reservations uh, about vaccinating children who are largely unaffected. And yeah. I think those vaccinations are much more effective used in the, in the third world. But it's not just people talking about lockdown. They're doing it. You know, yeah. I am getting complaints from parents because ch whole year groups have been sent home yeah. to start remote learning again. They're running well ahead of anything that the government suggested. People are cancelling their parties. Yeah. A huge devastation to the uh, end, to the um, hospitality business. People are, you know, already working from home and all that that goes with it. We know how efficient they are at home. You know, the whole thing is just mad. I mean, this is the thing. It, do, it does sometimes feel like it, it's mad. I thought it was a wonderful moment of hope yesterday when Theresa May, the former prime minister, the first former prime minister to speak out uh, like this, said that you can't keep stopping and starting the economy every time there's a new variant and government should be learning to live with COVID. So there may be a number of people who want to take extra care and maybe people who should take extra care if they are... Uh, immunocompromised or if they're very elderly when there is a new variant and, 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 and make reasonable precautions and family members may want to take tests before they see them to try and make sure they're keeping them as safe as possible. But that's not a reason to have any restrictions on people who don't want to have them on their lives, who are willing to say, I will take the risks that you know life throws at me, but also younger people who are at a 
already an infinitesimally small risk of dying anyway or being hospitalised, and certainly with double jab and or beast booster at a tiny risk. Well, I, that's that's the position that a number of us took from the very first lockdown, that, you know, the people who are vulnerable are pretty well known to us, yeah. by and large, and we should have incentivised them and made provision for them uh, to shield themselves, and the rest of us should have gone on and lived normal lives. We'd be vastly better off now as a consequence. And, and yeah, and that's the issue, isn't it? Um, look, I mean, even um, even some of the unintended consequences of other policies, like, for instance, the mandated jabs in care homes yesterday at emerged that a care home in Kent has given families 10 hours notice of closure before they have to remove their loved ones because they've just got such a shortage of staff. They simply can't provide care anymore. Legally would just not be allowed to continue. And they basically said, come and collect your elderly mothers and grandmothers and grandfathers because we can't look after them anymore. Well, those people now living in the community... Uh, probably not without adequate care, family members in crisis as well. These are the unintended consequences of a lot of the policies that a lot of people cheer on. Yeah, so we sacked 40,000 care workers because they wouldn't have a vaccination. And we're about to do exactly the same to the NHS without any plan for how to replace them when we already have a shortage. It is bonkers. What do you make of um, the government now? I mean, the I newspaper today reporting that um, they say the UK minister's bullish about no plan B as Omicron starts to spread in community. There's very much a focus, and I'm hearing this both on the record and off the record from when I get often much more, much more fulsome comments from, from senior figures in government, that they, you know, they, the focus is on hospital numbers, not on cases. And all the hysteria about cases, which, by the way, is only, they only talk about cases when cases are going up, not going down, even though most of the cases we're seeing now, again, are primary school age children who are, I mean, virtually zero risk. I mean, genuinely could not care less about a primary age child getting getting COVID. And so I didn't worry at all about my 14 year old getting it as well. But um, it, there is this idea that they are saying, look, we're focusing on hospital numbers and only hospital numbers. And 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 so cases we're going to try and ignore. Do you think that's going to do you think that's going to wash with large sections of the public and the media who are busy either scaremongering or lapping up the scaremongering? Well, I really don't care whether it washes with them or not. Well, they're so the ones putting the pressure on so the government, So long as the government sticks to its guns. That's uh, the important do we, I mean, The trouble is, if my freedom and your freedom and the fate of the economy and the mental health and the education of children and people getting cancer treatment, if all of that rests on Boris Johnson having a backbone... I'm not as sure as I would like to be that we keep our freedom. Well, I'll keep praying is the answer to that one. Uh, praying for his backbone. Um, it, but because, you know, it, it comes down to that in the end. But even if hospital numbers start to rise significantly, and it might well not be with COVID, I mean, only 5,000 uh, hospital beds are currently occupied by uh, COVID patients, yeah. um, a very small proportion. It's gone down, and it's gone down in and, recent and, and months. And it's been going down, you're quite right. The problem will be when we get the flu epidemic and Nova virus and all the other things. And the danger is that we are required to organise and restrict our lives yeah. in order to manage hospital numbers. And that is a disastrous situation to have got ourselves into. Indeed. Can I ask you about Christmas parties? Uh, you know, people are cancelling them. Again, people I know are cancelling them, not because they're worried about COVID. They're worried about having to self-isolate. They're worried about missing Christmas. They're worried about missing a holiday, et cetera, et cetera. Um, in terms of the Christmas party that... Is anyone under any doubt took place on the 18th of December last year in number 10? Um, some, you know, staffers, civil servants organised in advance. Apparently there's a WhatsApp uh, group about it. There was a follow up email. People brought in secret Santa, secret Santa gifts. There was a quiz. It was a people brought in food and drink. It was a party. It wasn't a, oh, we've had a long day at work. Let's have a beer before we go home. Um, no doubt at all. If this event took place, pretty sure, let's face it, 99.9% .9 sure it did, that it was illegal at the time. Other people were prosecuted for less. Um, does it matter if Number 10 staff were holding parties while the rest of the country was uh, not allowed to, strictly banned by law to, from doing so? Well, I wasn't invited. Um, uh, I, I take the view that, you know, get a life. It was a year ago, so people went to a party. Perhaps they shouldn't. Um, uh, you don't think you know, it matters? It was, it, well, it wasn't. Well, it wasn't organised by the prime minister. It wasn't the government that did this. Um, uh, it, of course, people should. I, I if the prime minister the knew it was happening in the building he is in charge of, 
in where, where, above where his home I is. Mean, I've, I've always taken the view that uh, whilst I have disagreed profoundly uh, with the rules that um, Parliament, because Parliament did sanction these rules, even if only retrospectively, has imposed on us all, I am duty bound as a parliamentarian to abide by them. Uh, but if people who are not members of Parliament choose not to, that's a risk that they take and it's up to them. Except, yeah, other people got prosecuted and they didn't. But there we are. 8.18 is the time. Thank you very much indeed for joining us, Desmond Swain. I appreciate that.